Um, so excited for Easter time coming. Um, so yeah, just uh, blessed that you guys could be here. I'm trying to think if there's anything I need to announce other than that. Um, but uh, so yeah, so just thanks for coming to church today. Let's pray. Father, just thank you so much, God, for who you are. Just uh, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to be in this place today. I pray, Lord, that now we would just give you this offering that we'd ask that your will be done and that you would bless it. God, we lift up our prayer request to you, Lord, and ask that you would move, Father, that we would just see your mighty hand work, and that we would be excited and, rejoice, uh, be, and rejoicing because uh, we know that you love us. We know that you're the good and perfect answer. We, we know that you have a perfect plan for each one of our lives if we just turn to you and trust you and seek you. So, Lord, here we are. So we thank you for this time. We pray that we could just worship you. We welcome you to this place. We just love you and thank you. In Jesus, let me pray. Amen. I want to invite everybody to stand up and worship with us. Welcome.
talk about singing until the whole world hears. But what it's talking about is God wants us to go out and tell people about Jesus. So people can have a life like ours. No one's life is perfect. We all have trials and tribulations. But when we have Jesus in our lives, that makes it a lot, lot easier. And he's with us all the time. so beautiful and we thank you God that you do take care of us and we thank you God that you're the constant in our life in our world today everything changes all the time from moment to moment there's change there's change there's change and that can be very difficult for us as human beings God but we thank you that you're constant you're faithful and true and that you love us that we're your children and you want the best for us God so help us to always remember that that you want the best for us Lord thank you Jesus
Lord, we come here today. We come here to worship you. We come here to praise you, Lord. We come with our arms wide open. We want to give back to you today. You're always giving to us. We want to give our praise and worship to you, Lord. Help us just to sing out. Help us not to worry if we can't sing or somebody else hears us or sees us. Let us just openly free our spirit to worship you, Lord, like you deserve to be worshipped. Here we come with our arms wide open, Lord. Take my life, I lay it down at the cross where I am found. All I have I give to you, O oh God. Take my hands and make them clean. Keep my heart. Purity, I may walk in all you have for me. Oh, here I stand, arms open wide. Oh, I am yours.
whole life is yours. I give it all. Surrender to you, to you, Lord, to your ways. We just sing that to you, Lord. Let it be. Let it be. Bless this time, Lord. Use this time for your glory. In your holy name, amen. Hello, hello, hello. There's an ice cream freezer, not an ice cream machine. You're back. Morning, morning. The past few weeks, this one word's been hitting in my head for a while, and it's uh, we've heard it for the Holy Ghost class and for just the sermons or whatever. But in Isaiah 41:13, it says, "For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear; I will help you." The name of this is called valor. What special quality makes a person stand out from the rest? Filled with determination to successfully pass the test. Mind and spirit in harmony as one, working together until the task is done. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. It is true as God and living in an evil world. Job had a journey filled with heartbreak and pain. The beginning was full of loss. The ending through faith a massive gain. As men stood terrified by the giant's strength and size, the shepherd boy stepped forward with confidence in his eyes. The fight ended quickly with the outcome amazing all, as the Lord's chosen one stood proud and tall. She moved through the crowd to get a touch for healing. At once Jesus realized something as he got a strange feeling. She fell to the ground and confessed what she had done. He told her that her faith healed her in front of everyone. Gideon faced extreme odds. What the Lord asked him, he didn't understand. Through his trust and obedience, he was given victory in the land. With all these stories told, there's a lesson to be learned. Help will always arrive if you trust and affirm. For courage is not the absence of fear. It's a simple knowledge that our Savior is always standing near. Hello, hi ho, hi ho. Hey, good morning. How we doing? You know the balcony's real full. I stood outside that balcony this morning trying to get in that door, and people were talking to me and wouldn't let me in. <laughs> now, I'm making an excuse why I didn't greet up there this morning. I should be fired because I got talking and didn't get up there and say hi to everybody. Hello, hi. Are you giving me the cold shoulder now? <laughs> I think I got most people downstairs, but I didn't get upstairs at all. Good morning, good morning. Jamie, how you doing? You still like me? Yeah? For now, don't say for now. I'll tell you a for now story. You want to hear a for now story? There was a guy that got hired where I worked. I'm just looking for something to interact with you about. I think he said his name was, we said, hey, what's your name? He got hired as a quality engineer where I was working. And he said, oh, you can call me Jeff for now. Because 
he thought he was going to move up in the company and be a big shot, you know what I mean? So we actually even put him in our, in our company directory as Jeff for now. <laughs> Jeff for now. Anytime, anytime I hear for now, I think about, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Jeff, how are you? Getting married soon? Yeah? You're relieved to know you're not on the same weekend as the other couple, right? Yeah, me too. I sweated bullets for a little while over that. Hey, 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 Ralph's right there. Ralph's right there. <laughs> Ralph is right there. If you don't know Ralph, Ralph's been through open heart surgery, and oh my goodness, you're looking good, my man. You're like slim and trim, and woo, you got like a sports thing on, like you're the Mr. Athlete and everything now. And Good to see you everybody, over here, everybody. Good morning, and the, right there in that set. Good morning, good morning, everybody over here. <laughs> <laughs> no, good morning. Okay, I've tried my best. Uh, what do I want to talk to you about? Uh, I don't know. Weather's getting a little bit better. Isn't that good? Isn't that great for all of us? Jim's here with my mom's husband right there. My mom's been kind of sick, and how's she doing today? Okay? Okay? Oh, my brother's staying with her? Yeah, he's skipping church to stay with her? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm making it. Father, thank you for time together today. Lord, I just like having fun with the folks that you send here in our church and try my best to feel and, and try to be near to them. And the way I know to do that best, just kind of try to laugh a little bit with them. Um. But Lord, you've gathered us here today, and there's a big crowd in this place, and I'm grateful. I, as a pastor, that encourages me much, Lord. So thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that you'd come and be among us today, that everybody that's come out today would not leave disappointed at all, that they would receive something from you, and that, Lord, we were able to be faithful in the thing that you've called us to do. From the very beginning, Lord, I didn't want to do this without you, and pray today, God that you'd be with me this entire time and you'd fill my mouth with words and God, that I'd be useful for kingdom work and pray, God, that you'd be present with us today. I sense, Lord, just a really uniqueness and a specialness about our church and it's not because I pastor here, it's just because you've surrounded us with these just fine people. And I pray, Lord, today that as you speak, you could just do powerfully something among us that you could speak to us individually, that you could cause us to see things we've not seen or things, Lord, that we've that not fully understood. I pray, God, that you just open things to us today that, that help us in, in a great way. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we have it before us. Thank you, Lord, that you're just present in it. God, that every bit of it's for us. We need it so. Pray, God, that I can just deliver it in a way today, God, that just connects and causes hearts to be moved and changed by just the way, Lord, you use me. So accomplish much in the time that we have, and we'll give you thanks for that forever. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in Matthew chapter 25 today, and I appreciate you for coming to church this morning. Um, Matthew chapter 25. I uh, feel like I'm supposed to be in, in this month coming here before Easter. I'm supposed to be tracking to talk to you about events leading up to Easter. Last week, Jesus, on the road, after, after rising Lazarus, on the road to, to Jerusalem, he tells his disciples he's going to be go to Jerusalem, be killed. They miss it. And then, I don't know if in this service we covered them both, but we, we, we talked about a blind man on the edge of the road crying out, and Jesus healed a blind man. And we talked about how that, that, that is a, very much a spiritual thing. In one service, we talked about Zacchaeus, and I don't think it was this service, but we talked about Zacchaeus being in the next little town, climbing, climbing up in a tree, and Jesus eating dinner with him, and how cool that was that Jesus recognized a, a, a little man and, and went into his house, and, and how they talked about Jesus, that he was friends with publicans and sinners. And Jesus said very clearly in that, I, I've come for those that are sick, or I've come for those in need. Okay? So we just continue on today, trying to do it in time order up to the time of Easter, which is coming, and, and I'm trying to get the Easter play written, and I'm mad at myself. I'm about an hour from being finished with it. Pretty excited about that, and I'd like to give out uh, Easter 
uh, parts to people who want to be in a play next week, so uh, bug me next week if uh, we don't get a chance to talk about getting, in fact, I might have some Wednesday night for you people that really want to be in it, but we're hoping. But uh, we're trying to work on the Easter thing, and we're trying to read those scriptures that lead up to that. Today, we're just in a teaching that Jesus gave to those that were around him about kingdom things. Now, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four Gospels, the story of Jesus' life, about 40% of those Gospels are really about the final week of Jesus' life. People don't realize that most, well, it's not 40%. 40% of those Gospels talk about that last week of Jesus' life. We don't realize that that much of it is about that week. And this is some of the teaching that Jesus did in that final week leading up to, so he's pretty serious about what he's saying, okay? And Jesus always does this thing, and I just love it, and you're going to see it. In fact, it's right here. Jesus begins often by saying, and the kingdom of heaven is like this. And I, I just, it's just amazing that Jesus can speak to us, and he says, hey, this whole thing is really about this. This whole thing that I've called you to, this whole thing that's in God, Hey, that was part of God's plan, how God does business, is done like this. And then Jesus tells this story that's so amazing, that's so accurate, that's so unbelievable, and he defines for us through a story that seems so random exactly what we need to hear about how the kingdom of God works. And here we go. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered them his goods and delivered his goods to them. So the kingdom of heaven, Jesus trying to teach us about the kingdom of heaven today. This is Jesus teaching about his kingdom, okay? And every single word in it is amazing and great, okay? Here's how it starts. A man comes from far, a wealthy man comes from far away. He's traveling on a journey, and when he gets to a certain place, in that place he calls his servants. You hear me? And he says to his servants, I want to give you goods. I'm going to give to you things you need. You hear that? I'm going to bless you. And that's always been an attribute of God. God loves and God gives. And everybody in this room, as God has, has well, this is a story about Jesus coming from heaven, a far journey, okay? And he comes, and every place where Jesus comes, and people he's trying, he calls his servants, you see that? People that want to serve him, and he begins to deliver his goods or deliver to them things that he has, he gives to us. That makes sense? And over the years, it's been pretty exciting to me to realize that so much of what I have isn't something that I got. It's something that God gave me, that, that Jesus gave me. You may get that? I know Barack Obama said that the, you didn't do this on your own. The government did it. And we all went, boo. But I can say to you today, you didn't do this all on your own. Most of who you are, what, it, God did it, right? And we could say, Yay! And for all of us that are servants of God, God is trying to give us stuff, hey, from him that's good, right? Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning, is what Titus says. So every good and perfect gift comes down from God. And God is trying to give to, per, to, to perfect. He's trying to give to his people these perfect gifts. Hey, because he wants to pour good into you. Does that make sense? So you become a servant of God. God wants to begin to give you stuff, hey, that makes you more equipped, better, better Christian. You know what I mean? And God is constantly trying to develop and give to you these good things that he has. And it's just like a good father loves to give good gifts to his children, right? Right? So we see this story. Jesus comes from afar. He calls all his servants together. Big group of us today gathered together. As a pastor, I'm pretty excited about that. And, and, and then the word for the Lord from the Lord today is, and he wants to give you good gifts. And he delivers. He, he, he even delivers. He's like Domino's man. <laughs> and he delivers good gifts to you. So he's, he's bringing it to you. To them. You catching all that? Next verse. And to one he gave five talents, to another he gave, uh, to another one he gave two, and to another one one. To each according to their own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Now you're going, oh, I know that parable. I got that parable. Let me break it down here some more for you, okay? So the Lord called his servants together. Here we are. 
And to some of us, he gave five talents. And to some of us, he gave two. And to some of us, he gave one. And you say, well, how, why is God so unfair? L listen, I, I don't think God's unfair at all. God loves us all the same. God knows what you need. And God knows what you can deal with correctly. God isn't a bad father in terms of giving you more than you can, it'll mess you up. So God delivers to us at different times in our life, in our maturity level, God gives us different things. That makes sense? Abilities. You catching this? And he gives to us different levels of ability. Now I will tell you, I'm just telling you, one of the hardest things for me as a pastor to do is to realize I'm standing in front of people and a lot of the people that I stand in front of are smarter than me. I don't claim to be the smartest person in this room or maybe even in the top ten. God has given me some ability. Does that make sense? And because God's given me some ability, I try to use that the best I can. You catching me? And God's given you some abilities. To some of us, he gave, there's people in this room that are super talented. There's ladies in this room that are amazingly talented. There's artists and singers. I could just go on and on. There's butcher bakers and candlestick makers in this room. <laughs> you catching that? I see Brad sitting on the back row. I, I know Brad's a very talented person. I don't know if Brad's figured that out yet. I know how much I love Brad. I don't know if he's figured that out yet. I know how much God loves Brad. Darlene, you should have stayed gone. I'm picking on him. There you go. And I can go through the room here. Dan Harris right there. God loves you. God's given you amazing giftings. You're successful in what you do. You know what I mean? God has given you stuff that's good. You didn't get everything, but you got something, right? And with what you got, it's a gifting from God, right? And I can just go through here, just go through this room. I see beautiful people. Kathy, you're just amazing. And what you put up with, I... Kathy Williams, right back there. Can I tell some of your story? I, I don't want to embarrass you in any way. But I want to talk to you about how proud I am of you. You and your husband... He, you pastored churches together, didn't you? You pastored churches with a husband. But at some point in your married life, your husband, he like went off to his mother, right, to care for her, and he's never come home. How many years ago was that? Five and a half years ago. You bought a business, didn't you? In fact, I, it's called Box King. Isn't that right? It's in the Bechtel shopping plaza down on Bechtel. If you ever need to ship something, take it to that girl right there, would you? She's trying to run a business. Her husband left her five and a half years ago. She's got her boy working in the store, a bunch of boys she grew up with, and, and she's just amazing. That girl is amazing. You know what she does? She just keeps on keeping on. There are people in this room that have these amazing, tough stories, and they've just, they just keep on trucking, man. Look at her, she might say, you know, she might say, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to kill him now that he told this the story. The whole, but I'm saying this because I want you to know there's somebody of amazing character and strength sitting on the back row right there who's been through tough things and she's not stopping. I go through this room. You can't believe the stories of the people sitting in this room. You can't believe it. You hear me? Ashley's back there. I'll just talk about Ashley for a minute. Ashley, wave your hand, Ashley, so they know. Oh, there. There's Ashley. Ashley's taking care of her crippled father, lives at home, takes care of her crippled father, and her mother is having trouble right now. So Ashley, and how many kids you have? You have three kids, don't you? Three. One boy that's kind of a little bit difficult. I'm not trying to be, he's, yeah, yeah. And we're not, we, we love, I was, when I was, but she's got three kids, hey, and a mom and dad she's caring for right now. Hey, sis, and I talk about it, and you get tears in your eyes because it's pretty lonely, and it? it's pretty hard to do what you're doing right now, isn't it? What? Yeah. Get back to the story here. So the Lord 
gives us ability. You get that? He gives to everybody. Everybody here now, everybody ought to connect with this because God's given us, even if it's one, he's given us some ability. You get, get that? And I want to tell you something. You ought to really embrace the things that God has given you because those things come from the Lord and there's something he's trying to develop in you and trying to do amazing things with. You hear me? Just tell you, as a little boy in a fifth grade Sunday school class, a man named Brother Lemon began to give me candy bars for knowing memory verses. John Ami says, and I memorized the whole New Testament. <laughs> John always picks on me. Anyhow, but I started loving Bible verses. The more I learned, the more I began to realize how powerful they were and I get those candy bars every week and God started planting something in me very young my dad was a builder and I was raised building my entire life it's just funny how God called me to an old building that needed a builder the how the recovery house that I run right now the man I bought it off of says this house needs an electrician I replaced like 10 or 12 panel boxes in that big panel boxes in the house that I live in right now because it was so outdated and so awful. God gave me an ability as a, a young man. When my parents were going through a divorce, I worked for an electrician for a while, and he taught me everything about wiring. And from a young man, I've been running wire. So I got that ability in me. You get that? I started, my dad had this philosophy. If it's broke and you don't have any money, you got to fix it. You need it. So just tear it apart. You'll figure it out. Figure it out. So I started at a young age because I didn't have much money and things broke. I started taking things apart and fixing them. So I started fixing appliances. We had appliances. I started fixing those things. And all of a sudden, God put some ability in me. And I've been, man, we delivered more washers and dryers last year than Lowe's, I think. <laughs> Are you hearing me? And God, over the years, it, it didn't come easy. Some of it didn't come. Some of it came through my parents divorcing and different things that happened. Some of it came in hard seasons of my life. But God put different abilities in me, not knowing that years later that ability would be something God would use for his good, for his kingdom. You get that? Because a man came on a far journey. This is how the kingdom of God worked. Jesus came, and he began to deposit in us all abilities. And some he gave five, and some he gave two, and some he gave one. But we all got them. According to his own ability, and that his is not capitalized, so it's your ability. He's doing it according to what's best for you. And, and immediately, as it says, the scripture says, he went away. Now, the Lord, hey, the Lord's closer than the cell phone to you. The Lord is near, and the Lord never leaves you nor forsakes you. But hey, God is leaving you. Listen, God is leaving you with the abilities that he put in you. Hey, and he has an expectation, like I do of my children, that I raised them, I've, I've poured into them, I've given them good things. I have an expectation they're going to mature in that and do something good with that, right? So Jesus, now related to ability, Jesus has given us stuff, and then he went away expecting us to take that ability and do something with it, right? This is how the kingdom of God is. Next verse. And he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five. So the guy that got five got busy pretty quick. And I, want, I just want you to know something. If you'll take the ability that God's given you and you'll put it to work and you'll try to mature that gift, the, the return on that kingdom thing that God has given you is going to be far greater return than you'll ever get in this world. Right here, it's 100% return you invested five you know what i mean you worked hard with five what you get you got five you know i'm telling you god it says sometimes people receive 30 sometimes people receive 60 sometimes people receive a hundred fold the greatest thing you can ever do in terms of your life is do with what god's given you because the return on that will be great you hear me you want to be successful Walk in the ability that God's given you. 
And God will give you a great return on that. You hear me? Everybody catching that? Y'all, all, all of us ought to be thinking about, what did God put special in me? And we ought to be saying, now what am I doing with that? What am I doing with that? Because all of us at least got one. Right? I was over at the Lund's house last night. Oh, my goodness. They put on a spread. You thought the king of England was coming to, you know what I mean? Well, Brian Ward was there, so it's about the same thing. <laughs> hey, uh, after we'd eaten ice cream and three or four different kinds of cakes, she says, oh, I forgot the brownies. And that's really a, a, a picture of that whole, how that whole night went. They had ham and ribs. I'd never eaten ribs as good as the ribs. I, oh, my goodness. Samantha was there. That made it even better. I thought, my goodness, God's given you some kind of ability here. I go places and, and see things and interact with people, and I, often the Lord shows me, they have this tremendous ability. We have people in this place. Ronica says she has 10, 10 kids right now. Oh, my gosh. 10, counting your own, right? So this fits. 10 difficult children. <laughs> I, I, I think so. She's got 10. She works with autistic children. She says, are you kidding me? How can anybody do that? Yeah, it's amazing. So God's put stuff in us. We think, oh, it's not a big deal. I want to tell you something. Everything that God's ever given you is a big deal. Little is much when God's in it. You don't understand. If God's given it, it's a big deal. So the guy with five takes it, uses it, gets five more. Next one. And likewise, he who had two gained two more. So the guy who gets two goes and does it, 100% return. Great! Next one. But he who had received one went and dug, a, dug in the ground and hid the Lord's money. Uh-oh. Just talk to you about this a minute. And, and I'm not trying to say anything to offend in any way. I'm just preaching scripture to you. Everything times zero is zero. You could take a hundred billion times zero is zero. If you do zero with what God gave you, you end up with People say, people, oh my gosh. I've become kind of a people expert over the years. I've been doing this long. You know, I youth pastored 11 years, and then now I've done this 25, 26 years. I, I've become kind of a people. And I, what I really pick up on a lot is just how people have excuses for everything. It's funny how people can do anything they want to do, but they have a, an excuse for everything they don't want to do. And there's people that have this amazing ability, but they don't do anything with it. But they have some excuse why. We're going to see this man's excuse here in a minute. We're going to, we're going to see it. And I, I'm just to challenge you, I want, I want to just speak, look at you and say, are you using what God's given you? Or is it a zero? Are there people in the church here that are zeros with what God, are you paying attention to what God gave you? Because, can, let me do it this way. Can I just, how do I say this? Some of us do this thing. Well, because I'm not on drugs, I'm doing good. No, you're just, you're just at a starting point. You're, you're just beginning now to walk into things that God has for you. Some people, well, because I'm not doing this, because I'm not doing... Some people just, you, you, they tend to justify where they are. I love, can I say this to you? I'm a 53-year-old man. I, I, I'm a guy that has tried to learn and grow and challenge myself. For me to stop using the things that God's given me at this point in my life, 
would be just the person, you know, and a lot of people do this. They get to a place in life where they just get comfortable. You know, I've worked all these years, they get comfortable. I can turn into a grandpa now and I can just coast to the end of my life. And I'm, not, I'm not a big coaster, I just want you to know that. Lord's put all this stuff in my life and taught me all these things and have all this ability, you know what I mean? And God's given me gifting and all this stuff. At this point in my life, I'm as useful in the kingdom of God as I ever, why would I get comfortable now? Why would I not be reaching and going? Hey, by faith, I got faith in me way bigger than a mustard seed. You know, I've seen God do great things. Why would I at any point stop trying to reinvest the things that God has given? You know what I mean? Why would I ever stop now? Why would I ever get to the place where I have an excuse where I can coast now? Or I can, whatever it is that your excuse could be, you know what I mean? I could, you know, at this point in my life, hey, worked hard enough to get to a certain place. We'll just kind of take it easy. Sometimes we see even use the scripture. I've learned how to be content in being comfortable. I, I, this is what I've always said to myself. Listen, when we get to heaven, there'll be a period of rest. You know what I mean? I hate to give up the Easter play right here, right now, but probably the last scene of the Easter play, now you're not going to come. <laughs> that same Jesus that you saw go up into heaven is coming back. Now go into all the world, preach the gospel to all the world. And what are you all doing? Why are you sitting here? Go get busy. This story that I'm telling you, this story about Jesus, Son of God, hey, gave his life for us all. Hear me, just hear me. This kingdom thing that I'm teaching right now is the truth about how God runs his kingdom. You, you catching me? It's the truth about how he wants to work with every single one of us. He gives us something. You understand that? He gives it to us, and he doesn't want excuses back. I raise children. I've tried to pour into them. I don't want them coming back 20 years from now, you know, and, and saying to me, well, I just wanted to be a beach bum all my life. If my kids come back, I'll slap them. I want them to take what I put in them. Hey, go develop that. Listen, life has hard knocks in it, and sometimes you can't. Listen, I just want them to go give the best effort they can. And I believe if people give the best effort they can, God blesses that, and there'll be some return on their effort. Does that make sense? But to do zero, you get zero. And this man is content with just digging a hole in the ground, and I'm, I'm just going to put it there. So when the Lord comes, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Next one. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Okay, you ready for this? For many of us that are Christians, right? We know the Lord. It, he calls us servants in this parable. You get that whole thing? It's real. This is really tough. But he calls us servants in this parable. And he's delivering us his goods, his talents. He pours it in us, right? At the end of this whole thing, that, that master, that, that what does he call himself? That Lord comes, and for every single one of us, we will stand before him and settle an account. You understand that? Every single one of us. Someday, I will stand in front of the Lord and have to give account for my life. It isn't that I'm unsaved. It's just, well, the Lord's going to ask me two questions. Two, I'm sure of it. One is, what did you do with my son Jesus? Lord, as soon as I knew who he was, I grabbed him with all my might. And I've loved him. I've tried, I can't love him as much as he's loved me, but I've tried to love him with all that I am. Then he's going to say to me, now what did, I, what did you do with what I gave you? Whoa. You can see it in this parable. There'll be a moment, every, one, every single one of us will stand before the Lord. And this, this thing is very clear. It's very precise how the Lord answers in all these situations. He's saying the kingdom of God will be like this. I want you all to know that I'm going to give you stuff and I'm going to measure that. I'm not saved by works. But the Lord knows if we are trying to develop what he gave us, we're growing and maturing. You get that whole thing? P. 
People sometimes will say to me, I did my duty. What do you mean you did your duty? Did you like advance to a new place or something where you don't have to do anything anymore? I ran into a lady this week. I just tell you, ran into a lady this week. I don't even know how to explain this to you. She has an asset that's of great value. And you, she, you know what she said to me? She said, Mark, in the kingdom of God, I don't care what God does with me. If I have to, I'll be the janitor. I'll come and I'll clean. And I just thought, you know what? This lady is super wealthy. And, and what she's saying is, whatever the Lord wants of me, I, I'm, I'll do it. Lord, Mark, whatever, whatever God requires of me, I, I'm willing to do it. I'll, I'll take this whole thing, I'll tear it down. I'll take this whole thing, I'll do whatever, whatever the Lord requires, I'll do it, I'll do it. It doesn't matter. I want the will of God in my life more than I care about these things that people think are of value or important. And I'll serve, she's my age, she said, I'll serve on my hands and knees if that's what God requires of me. I just thought, man, I knew what I was going to be preaching on. I thought, man. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants called them. It's a, it's, it's it. you got to hear that he's calling these folks that he gave stuff to his servants. You hear that? Came and settled accounts with them. Next one. So he who had five received five, he who received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. I don't know how to say this to you. But he actually even sounds excited. Lord, you gave me something, and look, I got five more, man. There's something about, I don't know how to say this, there's something about working in God's kingdom that's just exciting. And the Lord, it's just, here it is. I'm telling you, this is going to happen for every single one of us. Someday this will occur. And I'm praying we're all excited standing before the Lord and saying, Lord, you gave me something. Lord, I, it was great. It was exciting. And Lord, I just tried to get out here. Lord, I gave, brought back more. Next verse. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. We believe, I believe, that that's what the Lord's going to speak to every faithful servant that stands before him. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over much. Hey, this is the way I like to say it. Now get in here and play. You catching that? Uh, I, I think heaven, for most of us who have served and worked hard on planet Earth trying to do with what we have, that heaven's just going to be a blast. I get this big long story I tell. And, and basically, the Lord gave to us a, a, a Disneyland vacation right after 9 11. And there was nobody at Disneyland. It's a big story. I ought to tell it to you someday. Many of you haven't heard it. It's the most amazing story you'd ever hear in your life. My son, I think, still holds the record for riding Space Mountain. There was nobody in line. I think he wrote it 20 plus some times in a row. You want to ride? I know that day, I think I wrote it 11 times in a row. I was done about after that. But he, re he just kept going, he just kept going. There was nobody in line. And I'm just thinking, when I think of heaven sometimes, I'm like, hey, it's Space Mountain with no line. Now you get, no, I'm weird, and I have weird... Heaven's going to be like an amusement park with no lines. And a cruise boat I was on one time that had an ice cream machine with no guards. <laughs> Connor here? Connor, how many ice cream cones do you eat in one day? How many? 
60? <laughs> and a mother that was sleeping. And they probably asked me, I do this a lot. Hey, you care about an ice cream cone? Here's my answer. I don't care. I'm not a mom. <laughs> I do that all the time. Care if we have Mountain Dew? I don't care. I'm not a mom. Care if we have Mountain Dew on our cereal? I don't care. I'm not a mom. <laughs> there's things dad's got to do, and I try to do those things, but there's things dad don't have to do, and I... Now, my grandkids, it's even better. You want more Mountain Dew on your cereal? <laughs> hey, think about this. Think about it. In that moment, in that moment, all that you've ever done in your life is being measured. And behind the Lord, it's almost a behind the Lord, is this place where you'll live in the joy of the Lord forever. There'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. Everything, and everything will be made new. It's going to be, heaven is going to be the most glorious place you've ever, man, oh man, oh man, can't wait. Why do we serve the Lord so hard in this world? Because we're waiting on a day where we stand before the Lord, and the Lord say, well done, Mark. Well done, Pastor. I called you up there to that old school building and you took an ability that I put in you. You took something, you know what I mean? You ran some wires and you just kept running wires. From a little kid, you ran wires and you just kept running wires. I was running wires this week, man. And running wire, you know what I mean? Why? Because that's like something God put in and you, and you did it. And you, you pastored and you, man, them verses I put in you, you quoted some of those while you were speaking. In fact, in that very day, you quoted some of that stuff, you know what I mean? Because I put it in you. Well done, Pastor Mark. Well done. You, I, I, there was just a few things. I couldn't trust you with much, but a few things. And you've been faithful. In it. Now I'll make you ruler over much. Get in here and play. And I'll run like I got new knees. You hear me? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to find me two things. I always say this. I'm going to find me a palm tree. And find me a hammock after I run to the top of the highest mountain in heaven so I can just try to see the whole place. You hear me? Nothing I like any more than getting on the roof of this building because I can just see for miles. Just something about that that makes me go, oh, Lord, my problems are really pretty small. And I know you're, you even have a much higher perspective than this. That's what I'm living for. That's what we ought to be living for. You see that verse right there? That's what you ought to be living for. You, you, everybody? Anybody? I got nobody. Huh. Well, I'll be the only guy there, I guess. No, I'm joking. Next one here. You're being quiet. I think you're listening or sleeping, one of the two. And he, he also, who had received two talents, came and said... Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I've gained two more besides him. It's the same story, just he has two. What's the Lord say about two? Go. The Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Get in here and play. Right? Next verse. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. This is a confession that the man knew that he wanted what he wanted. You wanted to reap things that you didn't sow that I should have sowed and, and gather things that you didn't scatter but I should have scattered. I, I knew you were tough. I, I, you wanted things from me that I... You wanted things 
to reap. Next one. And I was afraid. There's your excuse. And I was afraid. And I went and hid the talent in the ground. Look. There you have what is yours. So he takes this thing the Lord gave me, just presents it back as though this is, hey, I've been afraid, so I just, here, Lord, I didn't lose nothing. I'll just give you back what you gave me. I'll just give you, whatever you gave me, I'll just give it back. There's no increase to it. I was afraid to do anything. I think the scripture is full of don't be afraid versus there's 365 of them, one for every day of the year. Okay. 90 plus percent of the time, people don't do things for the Lord because they're afraid. Now, they may have other excuses. I was afraid I didn't have the money, or I was afraid I'd, nobody would like me, or I was afraid that I didn't have the, a talent, or I was afraid of this, or I was afraid of that. I was afraid. I've, I've told you some of this. I was afraid the first time I walked up a jungle path. I got out in a boat. I got in a pecky boat one day and went up this river and went up another river, went way back up in the jungle in South America and got off this boat and there was a jungle path that led to a jungle village and the first time I walked up one of those paths, I scared to death. Oh my goodness. The first Easter Sunday I ever preached we had 100 people show up for church. That wasn't the first, maybe the second or third one. We had 100 people show up for church. I was so scared. I was shaking so bad. My hands were shaking so bad that I grabbed a hold of the podium because I didn't want people to see me shaking. I mean, I was shaking like this. I thought I was going to wet down my leg. I was, first time I'd ever spoken to 100 people. Now, I, I youth pastored, and we'd had more than 100 people in a youth group that I pastored. That wasn't no big deal, because that was kids. But to speak to adults on Easter Sunday, I was so afraid. I was afraid to step out and pass. I was afraid of this old building. I was afraid of this thing. I was afraid to get married. A whole bunch of stuff I'm afraid of. You ought to be afraid of electricity. It can scare you. It can get you. A whole bunch of stuff you can be afraid of. But if the Lord called me to it, it's called faith. You catching that? My wife, last night, Brad, you'll be interested. My wife last night rode with a highway patrolman. She did some training to be in the highway patrol auxiliary. It's becoming common because of all the police shooting and stuff that God is putting ministers in the car with police officers. It's just, she didn't know that was a trend that was happening nationwide, but she felt called to that. And she was eight hours with a man yesterday, and he kind of a church goer, but kind of sorta, and I don't want to get in that whole thing. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you who won last night. She witnessed her, so witnessed her socks off to that guy. And he was apologizing for his language. He was apologizing for everything. You know what I'm saying? And, and just I'm just telling you, my wife was trying to serve, trying to be in a place she felt like God, God called her and said to her, I'm calling you to a tribe. But in that, she's stepping out in a place where she could be afraid. Just think about what's happening to police. And of course, she's hearing all the stories and all the things they're worried about. They're worried, worried about tinted windshields. And they're worried about broke down cars beside the woods. They're broke, worried about setups. They're worried about guns in cars. They're worried about all kinds of, they don't know who, they're, you know what I mean? But the Lord called some 50, some old woman. <laughs> Look at her. She looks like she's in her 30s. 
God called somebody, listen, to ride in a patrol car last night and just to tell our story and to talk about how God's been faithful to us and how to witness to this guy and how to be a backup for him and how to be, and I'm just telling you, I don't know why she got called to that. We're, she's still scratching her head on all that. But it's something God called. And she, could she be afraid? Sure. Kathy, you've been afraid a few times, haven't you? Yeah? Has the Lord been faithful and good to you? Ashley, I promise you, if you'll cry out to the Lord, He'll be faithful and good to you. There's no re God did not give you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. You get that? The enemy wants to stir up fear. You, you, get, you get me? But God isn't about fear. God's not afraid. God wouldn't put you in a place. No, 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 no. If you ever give your life for the cause of Christ, God has even prepared you to do that. I don't know if you get that whole thing, but you're ready to do it in the moment it might ever be required of you. But God doesn't call us to that. God calls us just to walk in things that seem difficult, and here we are afraid. No, 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 I'm not afraid. I've never done that before. It seems scary. It seems this. So what? My wife's got a little prayer thing she has on one of her doors. A man who will kneel before God can stand before anyone. So this man says, I'm afraid. So I didn't do anything. I decided I'm, I'm going to do zero. And you wonder, I just... Just kind of press the church here. Do you have giftings that the Lord is giving you you're doing zero with? Because someday you're, God's going to measure that, and you're going to say, okay, Lord, well, the gift you gave me, here it is. I don't know how to explain this to you, but it's not okay to stand in one place. It's not okay to not mature. It's not okay to not do something with what God gave. Does that make sense? I don't care who you are or what you think your limitations are or what your restrictions are or what your insecurities are. It doesn't, none of that matters. God re requires, after he gives you something, that you're going to do something with that. And you think, well, what's the penalty for doing nothing? Oh, you know, the Lord's going to take five years off eternity. The Lord's going to give me a little slap on the hand. I mean, this is blistering. I just want you to know. This is blistering. For there are Christians, there are servants the Lord's given people, the Lord's given talent to, and they've done nothing with them. Here's one. What's about to come is something you don't expect. You, you think God's this great God of mercy and grace. And God is a great God of love and mercy and grace. In this lifetime, God will extend you to you love, grace, and mercy. He's doing that so that you might find your way. You hear that? But there's a moment at judgment time where you give account for everything. Judgment is, is postponed in grace, love, and mercy. Judgment is postponed until judgment day. And then you stand before the Lord for your entire life. Do you get that? And in that day, I've extended grace and love and mercy to you your whole life. In that day, we're going to judge and measure your life. Because the day of judgment has now arrived. And you're supposed to have been my servants... And you're supposed to be excited about what it is I gave you. You're supposed to be active in those things I'm trying to do with you. And this man shows up and says, okay, Lord, what you gave me, I'm giving it back. Thinking, that's okay. I didn't lose nothing. You know, a lot of times, I don't know how to say this to you. Well, I didn't take that down to the bar and drink it up. I didn't waste what you, I, you know, at least I'm, 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 I didn't lose nothing. There's a lot of wives, I don't know how to say this to you, just trying to make some kind of example. A lot of wives, husband, you know, husband, I, I need you, I need you to love me. 
I need you to love. I need you to show love to me. My greatest need is I need to feel loved. Husbands, love me. And a husband will say, well, I ain't been down the bar drinking. What's that got to do with anything? There's something I need from you. Don't give me what you're not doing or what you... Don't give me what you think is good merit. You know what I mean? Walk in the responsibility of being what you are. Does that make sense to you? Make these excuses for where we are. You catching me? Not for what the Lord wants us to do with what he gave us. You get, you get that? So, you gave me something, Lord, I'm just giving it back. Here, you gave it to me, I give it back. Is that okay? Watch. It's, it's devastating to have an attitude that I can not grow and mature. Watch. Next verse. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Now again, he was calling him a servant. You, you, I'm trying to get you to understand. At a moment in the future, there's a judgment day, and the Lord will call it as he sees it. You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I would reap, that I, that I reap where I did not sow and gathered where I have not scattered seed. How do you know that? Well, he told him and he knew that already. You knew. You knew who I was. Now, this is, it's important that Christians get this because we have this whole thing where grace is just going to cover me. We're just going to bless God. I'm just going to slide like, like a speed skate right through the pearly gates. You know what I mean? Many of you weren't here Wednesday night. Uh, Joel Osteen tells this joke. I'm so serious. I've got to break this up a little bit. Have you heard this joke, this Joel Osteen joke? It isn't doctrinally correct at all. A lady gets to the pearly gates. Peter, Apostle Peter, sitting there. And she says, oh, I can't believe I'm here. And he says to her, sis, you made it here. She said, am I in? He said, no, you got to do one more thing. She said, what? He said, you got to spell a word before you can get in. She said, what's the word? He says, love. She goes, L-O-V-E. Sis, you made Congratulations, you're in. And as she starts to walk through the pearly gates, says, Peter says, hey, hey, I'm sorry. I, I, I need to go for just a minute. Can you sit here at the gate and watch the gate for a minute? She says, what do I do? Well, just do what I just did with you. They got to spell a word. I'll be right back. So Apostle Peter goes away and leaves this lady sitting at the pearly gates. Just by coincidence, the next person to come up to the pearly gates is her ex-husband. And he goes, oh, my goodness. God is good, isn't he? I made it all the way to the pearly gates. I can't believe I made it here. She said, no, no, no. you got to spell a word. What? No. The only way you get in is you have to spell a word. He said, what's the word? She said, Czechoslovakia. I've actually looked up Czechoslovakia this week in case my wife's sitting there. <laughs> you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that you'd run and then you got it. Next verse. So you ought to have deposited my money with a banker and at, at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. You should have did something with it. If you'd have put it in a bank, I'd at least got interest. Now, enter into the joy of the Lord. I ripped you. Enter into the, this, this ought to rock our worlds. Next verse. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to, to him who has ten talents. I talk about that next verse. For to everyone who has more will be given, and, and he will be in abundance and have from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. You know that's why 
10% of the people do 90% of the work. Because 10% of the people are responsible people that are not going to be zeros. I live in a big house with a lot of people. If everybody did a share of the work, it'd make my load a lot less. But you know what happens? I'm the responsible guy. And no matter how hard you try to get people involved, if they don't have a heart for it, they're not going to do it. I've learned a lot in my life over time. You can't make somebody do something they don't want to do or change when they don't want to change. You can't ask somebody to help and expect them to help if help isn't already in their heart. Does that make sense? So the Lord said, "Just I'll just give more response. That's why I could get into this whole thing. That's why this whole bridges of poverty thing, I don't know if you understand that whole thing, this whole bridges out of poverty. People that have nothing tend to believe what they need the most is a relationship. And because they don't even know who they are yet, they, what people really need is a relationship with God. And in that relationship with God, God begins to reveal to everybody who they are. Does that make sense? And all of a sudden you begin being secure in who you are and what God called you to be. And then some point down the road after you've walked in that a little while, because you're very secure, you're very good in a relationship that God will give you. Does that make sense? But when you go looking for a relationship, because that's the thing you think you need, you just destroy all those, because you're totally insecure. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you want. You're, you, it's all a wreck. It's all a shipwreck. If you do things in the right order, hear me, if you do things in the right order, you put God first, everything else works out. Do you hear me? If you put God first, everything else works out. There's a promise in the scripture. If you put God first, everything else works out. If you put something else first, I guarantee that's not going to work out. And if you don't have in you the understanding of who God is, that God loves you and you feel secure in him and you know who you are, so much stuff in your life is going to be broken because you're looking for the wrong thing to make you happy. And people do it over, make the same mistake over and over and over again, thinking, well, it was this person or it was that thing. Or, no, 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 it's, it's, it's the order. I've got to get to this. Look how powerful this is. This knocks your socks off. Next one right here. Trying to get done. And cast the unprofitable servant. Now listen to me. This person was made to be a servant of God. You see it? The Lord himself is saying, cast that unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus teaches more about hell than he does about heaven. You want to know why? Because hell wasn't made for you, and he's trying to get you to understand. If you'll just live in me, you don't have to go to this terrible place. Let me describe this terrible place. There's outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For a guy who just came back and said, Okay, Lord, what you gave me, I'll just give it back. And the Lord said, You didn't even bring me interest? The words in that verse right there, and cast this unprofitable servant. This person was meant to be a servant. Get him out of here. You know how he says to the faithful ones, he says, Enter, you know, get in here and play. You know what he says to those who weren't faithful? Get out of here. Get out of here. And where the Lord is, there ain't no light. It's darkness. That ought to just cut us. The fact that the Lord gave us all something. And he wants something back from that. And if we're not faithful, you say, oh, God's merciful and his grace is. Are you kidding me? Because on that judgment day, the Lord's going to take account. Well, but I was the Lord's servant. Okay, look what happened to the Lord's servant that didn't do anything. We spend so much time. People can pick up the phone and call and encourage somebody. Spend so much time doing things that don't matter at all.
God's given you everything you need to do what he's calling you to do right now. That word unprofitable servant, oh my gosh, it scares me. Unprofitable servant, no, 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 no. This servant's going to be profitable. Right? Next verse, just finish out here. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of his glory, go, and all the nations will be gathered before. Okay, that's the next story. That's tough. And Jesus taught these things in his final week of life. Hey, try to tell us things that he wanted us to hear. That's hard preaching right there. And every single one of us have been given something. Right? Father, we thank you for time together today. Hard word, Lord, just a hard word. But I, I read it verse by verse, Lord, just the way it's in the scripture, probably the exact way you taught it. To think, Lord, that we can be called a servant and be unpleasing. And, Lord, ultimately separated from you forever. That just scares me, Lord. But let us all be found faithful, God, to those things you've called us to do. Let every one of us consider our lives today. And that day that will come where we'll stand before you. And look, Lord, and see those things that you've given us. Lord, just put in us. God, are they being used for you? That's the message you asked me to speak today, Lord. It's the teaching that come from Jesus' own lips. I pray, God, that we just search our heart in all those things and that this word would change us. Thank you for these minutes together, Lord. Touch our congregation, good, good folks present here today. Bless them, help them, encourage them, I pray. Go with us, each one. We'll give you thanks forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming, everybody. Hard word. Come back again. I'll be better. I'll do better. Come back when you can. Love you. Love you. Good to see you. Come back when you can. Thanks.